Welcome to the 16th. Do you believe that? 16th Techno Crime Fighters. Yeah, I can't hear anything. And this is Ramola, who's just come on the scene. We, hi, Ramola. Uh, and uh, on this uh, Techno Crime Fighter Force, if you're new to this, uh, this is mostly aimed at. Uh, oh, sorry, and here we. Another computer. We have, uh, we have three of our Techno Crime Fighter Forum team. We have Ramola D, uh, famous writer and journalist. We have uh, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Horton, particle physicist. And then we have Karen Melton Stewart, who is an ex NSA employee and uh, accidental whistleblower, she calls herself, it's great, which is a great title. Uh, today, we're going to spend the first hour talking about progress. And I know that people listening to this are either targeted individuals or people who are interested in this problem and want to help us. So this will be really good information. The first hour we're going to talk about uh, progress made by the investigation team in various areas and things that have come up this week and things that are unfolding. And then if we're lucky, and I think we probably will be, uh, in the second hour we're going to have Frederick LaRoche on. Now Frederick was highlighted in a story by uh, Catherine Horton a couple weeks ago about his being framed and uh, put into a uh, psychological home because um, of nefarious circumstances. But he'll be here to explain what's going on there. So I'll stop talking and let's get into the forum. Uh, Catherine, would you like to start and tell us your exciting news? Um, yes. So, so here's the, the update of um, what has been happening because we all have been working um, flat out actually. Um, before I um, get into the actual nitty gritty details, I um, would like to announce that we have um, a new website and um, I am actually thinking I should um, probably put it into the chat. Either, either Mindy has the link or I will put it into the chat um, here. Um, hang on. Um, so uh, the joint I'm investigation have, team. Uh, a new oops, website. Sorry. So the joint investigation team's new website is jointinvestigation.org. Um, so people can, okay, so people can go there and um, I'm not sure if you can actually see that in the chat. It tells me that I have to, yes, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Um, so Mindy's just posted um, jointinvestigation.org. That's the um, new home of the um, joint investigation team. There you can find um, at the moment um, the profiles and um, a rough description of what we do and what we are setting out to do. Um, and um, for those people who don't know, the Techno Crime Fighters Forum is the weekly report of um, actually the joint investigation team, which is a US-Europe collaboration between high integrity, high profile people. And we are running this criminal investigation in, in total absence of any sort of police initiative into the matter. And these crimes have become so prolific, so, so um, extensive that individuals who have the right qualifications have to get on the case themselves and the joint investigation is now as i said between us and europe so three of us are in the us uh, melanie richan is in belgium i'm in switzerland but i am because of the targeting on me happened in, in germany and the uk as well i'm involved in all three countries and what's happening in, in those um, and what we are planning to do um, as the joint investigation team is because this criminal investigation, this crime syndicate is so vast, um, no investigative team can do it on their own. So we are also asking for people in, in other countries and even in the countries where we are involved to imitate us and also launch their own private initiatives, private criminal investigations and put together the evidence and try to help the, the victims, um, you know, in, in this time period where the, where the police is totally suspended effectively so over the coming weeks we are going to put out um, information material so um, when people go to the um, jointinvestigation.org website um, there's one section called reports and we are going to release reports bit by bit um, and we are we will try to write up um, little documents about all the different aspects of targeting 
Um, so the idea is that um, once it's been certified by the joint investigation team, um, people can actually, um, you know, download these documents and um, and put them up. I, I think I'm getting some sort of feedback. I'm not sure. I think it's maybe, is it your mic? Okay, sorry. I think it's my computer here. No, it's not bad, uh, Catherine. Okay. Bad. Also, we're going to put the uh, link to your new uh, website, uh, the joint investigative team.org, below all subsequent uh, technical crime fighter forums. Fantastic. And um, what, what this is meant to be is the, um, the joint investigation team is, is working on a public interest investigation. And for this reason, all our work is public. Um, we have to be 100% transparent and also our work results will be public. So when we are publishing these reports, they are to inform those bits of law enforcement who are genuinely um, uninformed, who are not corrupt, but genuinely have been kept in the dark but also members of the public. So whoever wants to read these reports can read them and also download them. And the idea is that whatever we put out is certified by us five. It's the best of our current knowledge. And the idea is that as soon as you get a report, you can print it off and take it either to your local police station or use it in court or whatever. So really trying to pull the, the best of our research um, and, and also other people who help us and, and condense it down to the, the key facts that you need to know and that you need to also take to your police station and also to the courts um, should you want to sue these criminals. So that's, that's the idea. Um, so the joint investigation team reports are forthcoming. So watch that space and subscribe to the, um, to the website. Um, we also have a Twitter feed actually. So all the, um, the Twitter feed is linked on the front page. Um, and the actual, um, because these are news flashes that we'll be releasing, the, the actual Twitter address is at JIT flash. Um, and because we are, you know, we are uh, shedding light on, on the darkest corruption and the darkest crimes, our logo is a little a little flashlight, a little torch. So um, there we are. That's the that's the, the team, the public face of the team. Also, this week we have been um, working uh, quite hard to get um, yes to actually um, help individual cases. And the most urgent um, individual case is really that of of Dr. Melissa Black. So um, what I did this week at the start of this week is I also contacted the um, UN Special Rapporteur. Um, for torture. And um, last October, the special rapporteur changed. So now it's Niels Meltzer, who is a Swiss, a Swiss guy. Um, and he, um, I think he was um, voted into office, I think it was October or November, and he replaced Juan Mendez. Now Juan Mendez has already been informed extensively about the case of um, medicines. And um, there was absolutely no assistance forthcoming. When I spoke to him, and I spoke to him after I've seen several emails where both he and I were CC'd in, and I said, are you familiar with that case? He says, yes, well, that rings a bell, but I'm not sure if we decided to act or, or if we acted in that case or not. Given that this is one of the, the worst cases of torture that we've ever witnessed outside of Guantanamo Bay, I, I cannot fathom how this man cannot remember you know, if he's acted or not, where the last time he heard about this via email was just a few weeks ago. So um, I am bracing myself when we're dealing with the UN, I'm bracing myself for the worst amount of corruption that, you know, we can be faced by. We have to remember that these are the people who put out these, you know, agenda, this and that, you know, massive genocide plans. So, you know, that's what I call them. So, but anyway, I'm going to hold out. Um, because I think Ramola has uh, more details on that. I think Neil Smeltzer has already done a lot of work. Um, I think it was to do, was it to do with um, human rights and these weapon systems? I, you yes, he's got a book out, at least if you look at the bio on that website, you know, which um, highlights the special rapporteur for torture. It says that um, his book was on targeted killing in international law. So that's, if that's his specialty, then he's precisely the person we need to talk to because these are targeted killing programs, right? Around the world, not just in the US, but definitely around the world as well. Um, so, 
it, it's kind of astonishing that you haven't heard from him as yet because you wrote to him twice, right? Um, I did. And um, also, I mean, his case is very curious. So um, that's why I'm, so I'm, I'm holding out in exa exactly now. It was the, I knew there was something about the book title that was spot on. Um, I just didn't know the title. So yes, you're right. So imagine we have a guy who's an expert on international law and targeted killing. So that's exactly what we need. He is the person we need to work with. Um, but then there was something odd about his appointment because when I um, researched him, I came across these reports that um, Switzerland refused to sponsor him. So when people become special rapporteurs to the UN, they are, um, it's kind of like a, an honorary post and it doesn't come with a salary via the UN. And then the, the convention is that the home country sponsors him. And Switzerland seemed to refuse to sponsor him. So that's a bit odd. So he doesn't sound like a system guy to me because usually the system guys, they get money thrown at them and just go and whatever, just, you know, be corrupt for us, you know. So when there's no money, uh, it, it, it already is a good point, you know, if there's any sort of um, resistance. So let's see, you know, it could be fake news reports put out, but let's, I'm holding out hope. Um, also, what's really good is that um, he, I think, is located in Geneva, he in Switzerland, and I'm in Switzerland, so um, I can, um, you know, if there's any meeting happening, I can get in touch with him. Um, and he has got, um, just to finish off, he's got, um, I think eventually he was given a, um, a position as a professor of Glasgow University. So I contacted him also by his Glasgow um, contacts, um, and when I I also phoned um, the, the law faculty of Glasgow and they said, well, he doesn't have an office here. He doesn't have a telephone. So, um, you know, you have to go via, via the UN. Um, so that's it. I tried to reach out. Um, I certainly sent him emails and we just have to wait and see what he, what he says. Um, but he, I think he does have the, the powers to, um, to, you know, um, actually investigate himself and also report back to the countries. Yes, Catherine. And as you know, we talked a little bit about doing some kind of joint letter to him, right, on the basis of this of, of our team, but also as uh, representatives of others. Um, and perhaps what we should do, I know you've made several efforts to get in touch with him, but perhaps what we should do is also give it a shot, you know, all of us, um, sort of put our weight behind it and send him emails ourselves and try to contact him. I because think I think it's 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 really vital to contact him. Yes, I think if we want to have this wrapped up in a civilized manner, you know, I mean, in in other words, if when the the special rapporteur on torture is not going to do anything about egregious torture, what what is is he isn't worth his salt, you know? So yes, he has to help us, and and also. You know, we have all our national police um, um, services, all the national intelligence agencies and the military seem to be in deep capture. So, you know, it has to be somehow using um, supranational organizations to somehow pull out. Mm -hmm. And of course, we think, oh, yes, well, the UN, you know, might be totally corrupt. But I suspect that every, like, you know, Millicent met good guys in the military and also the police. And I, this is exactly what I expect. I expect the patchwork. I expect domains of corruption and domains of high integrity. So we have to kind of reach out to all people in all these organizations and get the people in the in domains of integrity. But you're right. We should contact him as a joint investigator individually. Let's have his email. Let's have his email so that everybody's watching this and everybody's watching it on YouTube later can send him a uh, little email. What is his name? His name's Neil Smelter. Yes, so I'm, I'm going to um, type it in. I'm going to type it into the public chat, actually. And I think I've got his email in Glasgow. So Neil Smelter. And um, I think he, he, you know, he should be able to um, reply to um, his email in Glasgow. Um, hang on. Um, Yes, I'm just going to, I'm going to post it in the chat in, in a moment, so just um, excuse me for a moment whilst I search for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll post it below then. We'll post it below this video also. Okay. He's a special investigator on torture. Um, interesting job. He's the special rapporteur for torture. I guess that's a word that means reporter, possibly. Not entirely yeah. so. 
Yes, so he, he has um, these reporting functions. I found, so I'm posting now on the public chat, the, um, oh God, it says, remove any web addresses and try again. Oh, come on, what is this? I'm not allowed to post web addresses in the chat. Okay, I'm going to post it here and maybe Mindy can post it. Um, you also post it below. Yeah, that's, uh, is, I, I can't understand them having a rap rapporteur for torture. I mean, is that admitting that it's, that it's going on and he patrols it? Is it? Does it mean that it's against the law and we should be watching out for it? Does it mean that they can only torture a little bit or certain certain? What? I mean, what does he? What's he do? What's his? I'd like to see his job description. Yes, I think um, his job description is on the UN uh, website. I think the idea is that um, he should um, go after cases of torture, and he is, I think, entitled to visit the country and and do personal visits, and then you know. But um, you know, one one of the things I would like to see, given that he's Swiss and I'm being um, tortured in Switzerland, can he come up from you know if he can visit countries in Africa and in Asia, can he make it up from Geneva to Zurich and have a look at my office, and uh, you know the bunker I have to live in. Um, and actually, oh, by the way, sorry, this is just one announcement and then I'll pass on the microphone. I wanted to draw people, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I want to draw people to the following announcement because if um, people go to my website, stop007.org, then they'll get to here, um, the top of the page. And when they scroll down to the bottom, here on the left, they'll see court cases and evidence. And then there's a quick link here to evidence that's at the bottom of the page. And I have posted evidence about the mutilation that I have now. This is totally hot off the press. And this is the mutilation I suffered after I requested cease and desist from the Swiss intelligence agency because I was irradiated in my home so hard I had to flee my home and I fled to a hotel. And I think it was in that hotel that at night, they came in and they conducted laser surgery on me. But shortly thereafter, I noticed that I had a scar on, this is my navel, and this is a photograph taken by my doctor, and you can see a line scar on my navel. And so I had it certified. I spoke to Melanie. She said, yes, I'm also implanted in my, in my um, navel. That's one of the key locations where they put implants. And lo and behold, you know, um, I think one or two days after discovering the scar, they started setting off the chip inside that they placed inside as part of the harassment routine. Um, and at some point I thought, okay, I'm going to see if um, I can actually detect it with the bug detector. And I have made a little video where you can, you can see it here. I'm not going to play it, but you can actually see how the detector is, you know, is showing a massive signal when you turn on the audio you can also hear this detector howling. And then when you watch the video in the background, you can see, I also explain at the end, I think, the bunker I have to sleep in. I think it's this video. Or maybe, maybe it's the next one I'm going to upload. But um, you can see my bed in the background and you can see how I have to crawl in into this bunker and sleep at night. And like Ramola, like Karen, like Melanie, I go to bed and I'm listening to the, to the patter of shots bouncing off the shielding. So that's my life in Zurich. I'm curious if the special rapporteur could be bothered to, you know, trek up to this canton. Um, and then I also put out a lot of information about measurements because it occurs to me, so here at the bottom you'll find the link section on measurements that takes you to the very bug detector that I'm using. I'm also telling people where they can buy it and what they have to watch out for when they're actually doing measurements. So this is the Atseco FC6002 RF tracer that I'm using. So the point, the reason why I, um, I went through all this to actually um, you know, put out that information is because I think a lot of the victims are implanted. So um, Millicent has got scans, um, actually showing the implants in her body. Um, Melanie has um, surgical scars. She had implants removed from her throat, an actual strangulator, and, and, and. And I'm thinking that um, this bug detector cost me, I think, 150 euros or something like that. So for 150 euros, you can buy yourself a detector, scan yourself, and see if you have any implants, you know. Um, 
I think that's great, Catherine. Really, thank you for doing that, for putting that information out, because I certainly am very interested. And I'm sure there are others, because, you know, some of us cannot afford the $5,000 scans with private investigators, but we still know that we're implanted. I certainly know that I'm implanted, and I can sense the various parts of my body which are responding to radio frequency signals being sent in from outside. But I haven't really proved it, you know, with actual physical recording equipment. And so I'd really like to get that, I think, and try to establish that. Yes, the last, the key thing to realize, um, and that was key for me is, um, so Melanie and I, we did a scan and she found the chips in my neck and that was inside a Faraday cage. Um, but now I managed to actually show, even without a Faraday cage, that this bug detector just goes crazy and you can hold it on, on the part of your body with the chip and then, you know, take it away and the signal immediately disappears. And if you hold it elsewhere where there are no chips, you don't get a signal. So if you do that 15, 20 times, that's pretty conclusive, you know. And there's one thing I'd like to clarify. I think um, yesterday when we were talking about this, uh, you talked about two kinds of signals. One is a signal that is sent to the chip and the other is a signal that the chip emits, correct? So this kind of detector would actually detect the signal the chip emits? I, th I think so. I, I think so. I think there's some sort of communication level because um, unless, unless the chip is receiving very, very focused beams, which I don't think it does because I'm inside, I think it receives this diffuse, you know, signal that's equivalent to the um, mobile phone signal, you know, um, and that, you, that should be just, you know, it's throughout the room. Um, so that should not change when you're waving this thing around. Um, but when it's, uh, um, so what this bug detector does, because it is a bug detector, it is honing in. It's, it's first of all measuring a very broad range from one megahertz to six gigahertz. So, um, so from one billion, hertz, sorry, one million hertz to six billion hertz. That's a massive range. And um, when it finds a very strong signal, it kind of hones in on it. Um, and it, it locks onto the signal and then it detects is the signal there or is it also coming from elsewhere because the idea is that you use it to find the bugs exactly. So, you know, you really want to hone in on the directionality of a particular signal. And I think that is the signal that the chips are emitting, actually. Okay. So, and that's relevant because another bit of news I want to make is, for example, Melanie, she... Um, she reported that um, she started working with um, some people in Brussels and um, every time she does, um, she's got um, implants in her inner thighs and they literally heat them up and make them burn. Now, I think that's a different type of implant. I think that one might not necessarily be sending. It might be maybe what's called light guides or, you know, they may, might store energy and then release it in the form of heat or convert electromagnetic energy straight to heat. But it, it could be nanotech, because when I was researching um, Millicent's article, you know, the article that I wrote for Millicent, um, we looked at her reports, and her reports actually talk about nanobiosensors inside the body, and about um, these, some of these um, nanotech sensors containing very thin films, like they're called ultra-thin films or something like that, and um, those when um, hit with signals, release heat through chemical reactions. Wow, I think when we get Melanie on next time, she can report it, but she showed me, she, she was just attacked today and um, she asked me to take some screenshots as evidence and literally her skin has been burnt up. Uh, she went and had it certified by a doctor, it's horrific because they burn you alive. They burn you alive, really. Um, and, and it's just the most, most shocking thing. And so I, I think the point is that those sort of, that sort of technology that, that might not be emitting, but then if they use um, tissue, you will find out by another means, you know. But, mm -hmm. So anyway, that's from me. I've banged on for a long time. But just on that subject, Catherine, the, the, the subject of burns, I wanted to actually make a note about how there are many people who uh, report being hit with these directed energy weapons who are reporting burns of different kinds, you know, on the skin. And it seems like looking at the array of, well, public domain information on military technology that's out there, such as the active denial system or the millimeter wave weapons, 
there's a whole bunch of different kinds of weapons out there that can create this kind of skin burn. You know, there's, as I said, there's this um, ultra thin film nanotech that could be under the skin. By the way, nanotech is something we are all breathing in. And if you listen to some of the experts who've been following the stories about nanotechnology and have been doing a lot of research, you know, such as Alana Freeland, for instance, um, you, you hear that basically these <coughs> nanobots, um, nanobots of various, nanobots as well as different kinds of nanotech of various kinds are raining down on us through these chemtrails and aerosols. It's not just solar radiation management. It comes down, especially in rain uh, and wind. Um, it may be injected up in the stratosphere. We see the planes, you know, with their load uh, streaking across our skies all the time. And, and you also hear that they are very uh, targeted to specific locations. So specific payloads could be targeted to specific locations. Um, and so what comes down enters our bodies, enters our skin, and enters our bloodstream. So if that kind of, if that stuff is, and we're talking about very, very tiny particles, right? This is nanometers, one billionth of a meter in dimension and this is inside our bodies and so these could be activated from outside by signals so that could create a kind of burning you know so that's something to research further no doubt but but th these are some of the realities of our current day living today which are not of course, they're not spoken about in mainstream press at all. You kind of have to go to YouTube and listen to various experts talking on these talk shows. Um, so there's that. There's these millimeter wave weapons that they are testing. If you look at some of the USFO's contracts with defense contractors, they're testing millimeter wave weapons um, and other weapons. But I do know for a fact they're testing millimeter wave weapons, looking at some of the contract information I've looked at. Um, and um, other kinds of weapons, no doubt. And there's also the active denial system, which the more you read about it, it's not just that one big um, piece of instrumentation that you see in the, um, you know, if you go, I think on US Army websites, you see uh, pictures and video of this one huge antenna system that's being used. Um, they're also using smaller portable ADSs. They're using infrared. You know, they're using heat. I can tell you last night, I was woken up about three times with intense heat laid along, the, along my spine. I was woken up. You know, we mm -hmm. all experience the sleep deprivation. And I'm, I see Melissa nodding her head. Perhaps she's familiar with this as well. Yes. Woken up with heat at my spine. Intense heat so, to the extent that I'm sweating. You know, even though the air conditioning is on and I'm supposedly supposed to sleep in comfort. No, I'm sweating because I'm woken up with heat at my spine and my entire body is aflame with heat. So what could cause that? You know, what kind of weapon, because clearly it's a weapon, uh, could cause that? Is that, are those infrared rays being directed at me? Are those, you know, they're definitely some kind of thermal or heat inducing rays that are being directed at me. You know, so clearly, and we are kind of working in the dark a little bit because a lot of this technology is classified and we kind of have to dig through and find out what could possibly match what we're experiencing, right? Yeah. So, Remember, let me suggest also that you try and get to a chiropractor or someone else who will do an examination of your spine and take some baseline x-rays okay. because I do have uh, severe lumbar spondylosis as well as cervical spondylosis as a result of the heating of my spine and of late i've begun uh last two weeks ago to have physical therapy for thoracic uh problems so see they're just generally wearing out my spine oh dear so do get some baseline uh reports so that you will be able to document any changes Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good advice. That's good advice. I kind of wanted to make the point basically that there's so much, so many different kinds of burning that different people are reporting. You know, it's not just the four of us. There's like thousands of people out there who are reporting being burned. We are being burned by microwave weapons, by millimeter wave weapons, by spectrum weapons, I believe it's called, right? Because they're across the spectrum by spectrum and sonic weapons. So, you know, to me, it comes down to how can the military dare to do this? How can local law enforcement dare to do this? 
because they are burning civilians in their own homes, inside their own homes, across the world. And they're, and they're getting away with it. I don't know, I'm sorry, I came in late, so I don't know to what extent you've talked about Millicent's cases yet, because I think that would be really valuable to talk about regarding how doctors are responding. When you go to the emergency room or you go to your local physician and you say, here are my symptoms, here is what has happened, here is what I'm experiencing. You know, what are the doctor's reactions? What do doctors know about what is going on and how are they responding today, you know, in 2017, in July 2017? Speaking of pictures, we also have pictures of Helen Thompson, who lives in Washington State. Oh, yes. And the pictures that I have show burns on the, even the bottom of her feet. Yes, and Helen Thompson's case, I should tell everyone, is an intense case. It's one of the worst cases, as you said, Catherine. It's another one of the worst cases that we have encountered. Helen Thompson is an elderly lady living alone in Washington State, and she is reporting burns all over her body, and she's been in close touch with Millicent, and we've heard some of her voice and audio recordings. How can a woman living alone be assaulted in this fashion? What has happened to our society that, you know, the military can get away with this, that the Navy can get away with this, that local law enforcement does not respond? She has given, I, I understand, pictures of her burns. She's reported these burns to local law enforcement. And, and Millicent, you can talk to us about what happened after she reported it, right? Because you know more about her case, I think. She gets threatened, even by her, her doctor, um, so she doesn't, she keeps quiet and she's afraid to talk about it, even to her family members. She is on oxygen and they gas her nonstop. They make her extremely weak and she is so frail to see her pictures even. She is so frail and it's like they don't care. These are, are you know, probably men in their 20s and 30s who are using her for practice to learn how to torture old women and this kind of makes it much more clear to us why they like to target children and and the elderly it's because they're less likely to be believed mm -hmm. and i find it shocking that when she shows her body filled with burns to her physician immediately the physician says this is a, a mental health issue when there's physical evidence of burns absolutely well, I think what we all have to wake up to, you know, is because um, there's, there's only one thing that's missing in here. And that is that 6% of the population are psychopaths. They are deranged. They are fundamentally flawed. And every psychopath, it's not every psychopath flips, but if, when every psychopath, if they wanted to, they could without giving a damn because they do not have the modules to care. They do not. And if you really want to understand what the psychopath is like, we have to go to the, to the actually detected, prosecuted, locked up psychopaths and study them. And if you ever went to an actual real mental hospital where these really deranged people are, or you go to a prison where all these serial killers are and you speak to them, they are deranged. They are gone. That's why they are never released because they are fundamentally flawed forever, you know. And the truth is that with 6% of, or 1% to 6% of the population psychopaths, in most of the psychopaths are not in jail. They are roaming freely. And one of the key aspects of psychopaths is that they lie without blinking. In fact, they like lying because in their ethics or their, you know, sort of worldview, if you can cheat on somebody else, if you're, you're clever. That's great, you know, because you have to understand in a psychopath's mind, he is an actual person and everybody else is an object. Right. That's why they think they are gods. That's why they think they are special species because, because of their mental, you know, the, the damage in their brain, the missing parts, they do not recognize others as actual people. They recognize them as objects to be manipulated. So for, to a psychopath, we're not sitting here as, you know, Ramola, Karen Millicent and Dr. Paul Marco. We're sitting here as a toaster, a hoover, you know, maybe a book and an iPad. And do they care about what happens to the iPad or the book? No. You know, if you break that iPad, you get another one. And that's the key. And what we are, we have to turn it totally around because I understand the shock. And I have to say, I've spent months in shock and now I just 
I just want to clear out this entire, you know, infestation of deranged people because they are mentally deranged. And in the next hour, we'll hear about actually the case from France where you can see criminals and deranged people in action and incompetence. And I think it's very simple to explain the case of, um, of Helen um, because when, when what psychopaths love to do is gang up on others, you know, and it becomes a game. They're just like toying around like a, a cat instinctively toys with a mouse before eating it, you know. So what they're doing with, with Helen is that because she is um, defenseless, because she's alone, sorry, this is all the aluminum in the background, if you can hear it, the windows are open, but um, they are playing with her and they will play with her until she dies. You have to realize that psychopaths do not stop themselves. There's no serial killer in history where you could just say, oh, dear serial killer, you know, make a public announcement over live television and say, Mr. Serial Killer, if you could please stop, see how bad this is what you're doing. And if you could please stop murdering women or, you know, kidnap children and then, you know, uh, leave them somewhere disemboweled next to the street. It's not going to help because these people are mentally deranged. You know, and it's what the, the key we have to realize is that all the people who got us onto these lists, some of whom we know by name, you know, they are deranged. And there's okay. absolutely no amount of emailing them that will help them. We have to remove them one way or another. Yes, but also I think it's very important to establish, Catherine, that we are living in a time period when these people that you're talking about, these deranged psychopaths, they are now everywhere. They're in the top echelons of government, top echelons of the intelligence agencies, in the top echelons of the military, every branch of the military, and every branch of law enforcement, and every branch of medicine and psychiatry. These are the people who are setting policy, who are making strategic policy decisions that get written up as laws and regulations, that get written up inside things like the common rule, which is supposed to protect people, but um, it, uh, ends up protecting um, researchers and permits them to experiment endlessly on humans. So we've entered a time period where everything has been rolled back. The Nuremberg Treaty has been rolled back. Informed consent has been rolled back. Common compassion has been rolled back. Humanity has been rolled back. Everything's been rolled back. And these psychopaths have come in and created policy uh, situations all around whereby they permit themselves to test deadly weapons that will cause burns on human bodies, that will cause damage to organs, that will neurohack and biohack human bodies. They permitted themselves to test weapons. And they permitted themselves to use surveillance radar, which does the same kind of thing, which, you know, fibrillates and oscillates different parts of human bodies, which can see through walls and can burn through walls. Various other technologies, of course, scalar waves, whatever, you know, different triangulation technologies from satellites, technologies from implants, anything goes at this point in time. They have given themselves permission to simply assault the human body. So we are living in a time period of lack of conscience, lack of ethics, lack of humanity, and uh, lack of, you know, the Nuremberg is gone. It's gone. There is informed consent has gone. It's fallen by the wayside. Torture is in currently, you know, and this is, this is and, and I blame both physicians and the military for it. And, I, and I'm talking about physicians at the top levels of the NIH, the guys who sit on committees and create these laws and regulations. They just went through um, supposedly revamping the common rule. You know, they spent five years supposedly revamping the common rule and what did they end up with? They ended up with the end of informed consent even further than it was already rolled back. And they permitted both criminal justice and intelligence agencies to, to have waivers. In other words, an intelligence agency can do anything it wants because these are considered normative intelligence and surveillance activities. It can experiment on humans as much as it likes all over America because these are normative intelligence activities. So this is what the so-called um, big shots, you know, the big, the, the doctors with the big, um, the names and the, the long years of education, the long years of teaching, the, the several degrees behind their name. These are the guys who sat on the Presidential Bioethical Commission and SACHOP, you know, the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Human Research Protections. They sit on these committees, they talk endlessly, and they come up 
with this, which is anything goes, you know, lack of informed consent, informed consent totally rolled back, and uh, everything in favor of the military, everything in favor of the researcher, the medical researcher who wants humans to research on, um, whether it's in neuroscience or cybernetics or artificial intelligence. This is what they come up with. So this is the time period that we're living in when you, you have professionals sitting on committees doing things like this. And you know that certainly that's the species you're talking about, the psychopaths. But they're psychopaths with degrees, they're psychopaths with teaching positions in, in famous universities, they're psychopaths who are professionals toying with human lives. Yes, so I thank think. God. So thank God we have Neil Smelter out there reporting on the torture. You know, he works for them. He works for them. I don't want to discourage you uh, writing him because I, I think we should drive the man crazy with incidents of torture. It's going on all over the place. Uh, and he's the rapporteur for torture in the UN. Hey, My Paul. God. Paul. It emanates. Go ahead, Melissa. I'd like to just clarify just a little bit about what that position does. I met. Um, Juan Mendez in 2013, after he wrote a report to the Human Rights Committee at the, at the United Nations on torture, cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. And it was specifically about psychiatric, uh, forced psychiatric detention. What he said and what is, is uh, published in this report is anyone who is forced into a psychiatric facility or forced to take psychotropic medications, that's considered torture. And the report was very extensive, it was very good, and, and following that report, or in support of that report, was when I did the uh, change.org petition to stop forced uh, uh, involuntary detention, because it's actually it's a cover-up for human experimentation and military training. With the change.org petition, Every time that petition got signed, a copy of the letter went to Juan Mendez. So since Juan Mendez has left the position, I have now exchanged Neil Smelser for him on the change.org petition, and we continue to encourage people to sign it. And it's getting a good response, but every time the petition is signed, that letter that discusses why we're asking Congress to uh, actually in install a law that will allow us to not be forced to take drugs or force into a psychiatric hospital based on Juan Mendez's report that it is considered torture. A, a copy of the letter goes to him. So by now he's very familiar with us. He's very familiar with the, the kinds of people that are experiencing the torture because I'm, I'm believing that their name is on that letter. So since last October, uh, he's been getting letters, and, and he's very aware of, of our situations. I have also been sending him and CCing him on some of my communication with the local police department, uh, also with the local vice mayor and the uh, local city manager. Like Catherine, I've not had a response from him at all about it. But the point is that what they are overseeing is not just torture, but also cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. And all of those are activities that is reported extensively by the Physicians for Human Rights in not just one report, but at least three. One of them is entitled, Break Them Down, Leave No Marks. Well, they're leaving marks on us. A second report is entitled, Broken Laws, Broken Lives. And then they did a third report strictly on torture. The, a, a, as a medical, I'll have to get the exact title of it, but, but from a medical perspective. And these reports are written by medical doctors and JD degreed professionals. So they are extensive, um, extensively documented. They do include short-term as well as long-term damage that one can expect to find from in a victim of torture from those military uh, sites like Abu Ghraib or Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan. They also include the legal ramifications of torture. Now, again, I'm talking about the reports that's been written by the Physicians for Human Rights. You should go and make yourself very familiar with them. In one of those reports, they actually cite a Supreme Court decision against the state of Tennessee 
for allowing torture, for allowing actually psychological abuse. That um, that case is, is Ashcraft versus Tennessee. They actually cited that. And so when I found that boy, I got right on it, looking into it more, because that's exactly what's happening to me now. I'm being allowed to be psychologically abused, not just psychologically, but also physically tortured right here in Tennessee after the Supreme Court has made a ruling against that practice. I th yeah, I, I think this is really valuable, actually. We should quote this case um, that you mentioned. Was it um, Ashcroft versus Tennessee? Is that right? Correct. Yeah, because we should put that onto the, so the joint investigation team will also collect all the legal, you know, the, the one that Karen usually quotes as well. That's a really important one. You know, we put all these um, um, different legal, uh, how to put it, things, useful things to quote at the, you know, at these people and in your legal proceedings, we should put them all together. I think what, um, I think this is all laudable that these people were doing. However, there are two things that I find um, very, very, very interesting. So we have these highly paid UN places and Juan Mendes, and they put out, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of reports, but they describe in detail how people are tortured and how it's really, really bad. And then pages and pages about all oh, the victims and how the victims suffer. And this is the victim, you know, the damage to the victims. And I say at some point, okay, now if you spend 600 pages banging, blathering on about that, uh, can you tell me something about the perpetrators and how they got there? You know, like Guantanamo Bay. Tell me the name of, the, of these, this doctor. There are emails from the doctor saying, you know, typing a happy email saying, oh, yes, I'm about to go over there and, you know, try some other stuff. You know, I'm like, how come if this is torture, you haven't, you know, dug out that little, little criminal because these are criminals, you know? And what I want to hear now is we, because my suspicion is, sorry, I'm not criticizing anything you said, Melissa, sorry, I'm, I'm getting angry about this total massive omission because my gut feeling is that what we're actually looking at, and this is how well hidden it is, this is actually a porn industry for sadists. And when they're putting out long and long documentations about how the victims are suffering, I think what we're missing is that a lot of the people are actually getting off on that. And a lot of the people in these committees as well. And then they think, oh yeah, this is the kind of stuff that we, we can do and that we are doing. And this is how people suffer. And then they get their lives destroyed. And the sad truth is that there's a large fraction of the population who thinks that's a good thing. And that's why there are pages and pages about the suffering of the victims and not a single page of in investigative journalism or investigative you know, forensics about who are the perpetrators. Because we have all the satellite systems you know, all around the world. We can, we can literally track the perpetrators from any offense all the way to their home. And they pretend like, oh, we don't know who the perpetrators are. And I think we have to totally ram it around and say, okay, we heard about the suffering of the victims. Now on to the, what are we about to do? We want to know who are the criminals and we will name them criminals. And we have to say they are criminals in the police, they are criminals in the military, and they are criminals in the medical profession. And this doctor who is threatening Helen, he's a criminal. He's a criminal. And the other thing is they are also psychopaths. And what psychopaths love to do is they gang up on victims. They isolate them and they gang up on them. And I'm thinking, that works. So let's just take some individual psychopaths and gang up on them and literally think we're not going to rest until we have finished them off, administratively speaking. You know? And then we go on to the next one. And literally, we, we find the biggest psychopaths and we track them down as a community and we keep hunting them, you know, and we keep terrorizing them with law cases, complaints, and we just do the same thing to them that they do to us. But the big fat difference is that we actually have got evidence and we just keep terrorizing them with jail. Catherine, those, those people that, that you're talking about, the, the, those top criminals, I mean, they're literally, they're in the top positions. We're talking about the heads of intelligence agencies. We're talking about John Brennan and James Clapper. You know, we're talking about everybody who heads those intelligence agencies, who heads the military departments, the Marine Corps, the special forces, ops, the US Navy, the US Air Force, plus all of the guys, the CEOs in these defense contractors, you know? General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, 
I don't know the rest of their names. We have to look it up. But, you know, those are the guys that are running this on us. And um, I posted um, Kevin Ship's video recently on my website, you know, for the 4th of July, because I just listened to him. And I was talking to you guys about it recently, I know. Um, so he's talking, this is a talk that he gave in October at Geoengineering Watch. Um, and he was talking about secrecy and what it's done to this country. And he's got this incredible slide where he actually gives the information about the numbers of government agencies now and private companies that are engaged in the work of secrecy, where everybody who is involved, who is employed, is sworn to secrecy. You see? So he's talking about more than uh, 1,200 government organizations that are working with secrecy. More than, uh, I, I forget the numbers at this point, I'll have to look up that slide, um, but something like um, 1,800 private companies or more than that, private companies who are working in, in the realm of secrecy. You know, these are covered operations, but everybody is sworn not to disclose what they are doing. And then you have, on top of that, tens of thousands of people inside these organizations. You know, so, um, so the question becomes, we've, we've created, in a sense, a society which is pitted one against the other with a huge portion of society working with these military and intelligence agencies. Thousands and thousands of people, even working on, in Google and Facebook, because Google and Facebook have now cut deals with the NSA and the CIA, right? But they're not supposed to say anything about what they're working on. And what are they working on? They're working on spying on us, taking all our data, listening to us, sitting on our computers, stopping us when we try to make videos and audios, you know, speaking out about this, this kind of stuff. And, and plus, there's this whole other um, conglomerate working on targeting individuals with EMS weapons and with neuro weapons which, you know, the, the subject close to our heart. A whole bunch of private partnerships and private companies working on that. Lots of deals cut on the side. Insurance fraud associated with it. Identity fraud associated with it. As, um, you know, Karen and I and Midge have been trying to uncover in some conversations. Now on Real Talk True Media. Um, so you can go to this web, new YouTube channel if anybody's listening out there. We've just launched it. And we have two conversations there with Midge, our resident researcher, uh, who is pulling out literally the ways in which organized crime has invaded our society in America and how private companies are working with the DHS, working with the CIA, working with DARPA to literally prey on people like us, which is really normal people, ordinary people, everyday civilians who are just trying to go about their lives, but we are being preyed on by this sector, the secretive sector. So I just wanted to say that, that you know, there's this whole um, uh, split that has occurred in our society now, where you have this whole, where secrecy, where walls of secrecy divide us, divide our societies, and permit one group of people to prey on another group of people. Yeah, Ramola, I would. Was it Karen? I said yes. It's predator prey. They go to these people and they tell them you're special, or they tell them, "Look, we're we're going to uh, basically be on top. You can either be with us or be crushed with us." And then they start to engage them and tell them how very special they are, which is so very ironic because what they're doing is they're taking the dregs of society and they are using them to destroy the core of society. You know, um, you're gonna have, you know, basically the masters and their little roaches is all that you're gonna have. And it's just so ironic, it really is. I mean, they're not special. They're only special in that they're stupid and malicious and petty and greedy. And so they self-identify as the bottom of society. Um, and I've never used this term before, but I would definitely classify them as useless eaters. You know, that's harsh, but I, I think that's true because they serve no purpose. Karen, it's funny that you would use that term, though, because that's what they call children and the elderly and the mentally ill and the developmentally disabled. 
Yeah, but that's but they're wrong because sure they're wrong. Of course they are. They, they are the useless eaters. They Absolutely. are the inhuman predators. They Absolutely. are the counterfeit human beings. They look human, but they are not. They self-identify by doing this as monsters. Absolutely. And we I self-identify as rabid dogs, and we do not keep rabid dogs around hoping they'll change. Mm-hmm. And I understand they're cutting deals now with, with convicted felons, with people who are in the prison system for, you know, actual Probably. convicted criminals, c- cutting deals with them to, to engage as perpetrators in this weapons wielding, weapons pointing scenario that's going on all around us. Um, you know, and we're talking about microwave weapons, of course. Um, well, they, they have to have the guys who will do the dirty work. I mean, you go to InfraGuard and those people are fools. They're told they're special and that they're patriots and that they're ridding the country of uh, harmful people. And they know that, I'm sorry, they know the Constitution. They know they have no right to do that. They know that secret accusations and secret evidence and secret witnesses, that's wrong. That's why we had the Constitution to, to begin with. They know this. I mean, I, I, I'll repeat again, the police are always telling you excuse um, of the law is, no, you know, basically uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, I'm sorry, but ignorance of the Constitution in this country is no excuse, whether you are a civilian or you are uh, wearing a badge. It's no excuse. You know, off with their heads is what I say, you know, you know because they, they don't have an excuse. They're destroying society. Um, and... You know, how, how do you say, oh, you know, I, I, I've, I've toyed with the idea of making, you know, because I draw, making cartoons, having somebody go, oh, boy, could you join this club? Because we get to kill people when the prizes are big screen TVs and trips to Disneyland. And it's so fun. And we don't have to show our faces. We can hide and kill people. Mm-hmm. And we're, at that, mm-hmm. we're in a group of a thousand to one against one person. So we'll never get caught. There's no danger of you being hurt for being a sadist because you're in this group and you're special. You know, how about commercials like that? Mm -hmm. You have just rehearsed the protocol of that person that I, whose name I don't call, who was perpetrating me. That was his announcement in 2008 to the community. Exactly what you just said. Yes, it's okay to kill. It's okay to treat this person as a victim. Anything can be done to this person. This particular person has no rights. And by the way, I've heard this from various other people who've had conversations with with, um, insiders who actually say this. You know, so people who are targeted today are actually being put on extermination lists. These are targeting until death lists. And what people are being told is, that's it. These persons who are on these lists have been slated for extermination. Therefore, they can be trafficked out to any kind of research project. And this is why they are. And this is why people become um, subjects of multiple research projects with multiple universities. So here, here's once more, you know, the issue of universities. Are university researchers, are university professionals stooping so low as to dissect and experiment on people with this kind of incredible weaponry, electromagnetic radiation, without conscience whatsoever. So people, and the military, of course, for weapons testing. Well, let me call out one person who works at Florida State University in Tallahassee, where I was, and and the targeting began. Uh, One of the stalkers had Um, F-S-U-P-R-O-F on his license tag. Wow. So when Florida State basically sends me, uh, you know, requests for donations, never, never, never. Not giving, I mean, I graduated from Florida State University and I'm sorry I did. My father was on the first uh, football team. My mother named the Marching Chiefs, the, the band that is, you know, their pride and joy. And I'm ashamed of it. I have really thought about taking my diploma and anything having to do with Florida State University and burning it on a video and posting it. I'm so disgusted. I'm so disgusted. Mm-hmm. And if you look at it another way, I mean, that's it exactly. It's like the universities are trolling for subjects and the military is trolling for subjects. 
you know, so basically the, the subject or victim interchangeable. So the military is trolling for victims, someone they can hit on to, interminably until death with their weapons. So this is the U.S. military, and I, I want to actually pull in what, what Catherine said a minute ago. We need to focus on these guys, and we need to target them. We need to target these guys who are targeting us. We need to target them, put their names out there, name them and shame them continuously, because what they are doing is they are targeting innocent and outstanding men and women and children all over America and all over the world, and they are destroying lives. They're destroying lives with carcinogenic electromagnetic radiation weapons and sonic weapons and torture, systems and protocols of torture. And no, with slander. I'm sorry? And with slander and character assassination. And with oh, yeah. slander okay. and defamation. And by well, the way, that's written into their, their military documents and into their regulations. They permit themselves to slander subjects of experimentation. Really? Yes. I need to see that. I should I should pull up the documents and send it to you. It's either it's either one of those journals of military deception or uh, AR22 wow. or one of those regulations. You know, between the CIA and the DoD, they 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 become interchangeable at this point in time wow. in terms of what they permit themselves. And can you can imagine I? the hubris of somebody engaged in secret cowardly murder, slandering their victim? for something that they have sat there and watched the person in their life and they see no evidence of whatsoever. F yes. So you see, they've told themselves if the person is, is under surveillance and anyone under surveillance can now be experimented on, that person can be defamed. Can, their character can be defamed. Deception, active military deception can be applied to their character. It's to dehumanize them and give these people a reason to continue and to feel exactly. good about themselves. It's just exactly. what the Nazis did to the Jews, you know, and yeah, uh, and they've written it down though. over and over in history. You know, it's unfortunately something that works and people fall for it all the time because people have an innate desire to feel superior to someone. You know, and I look at the InfraGuard uh, and I call them InfraTards. Uh, in Tallahassee and elsewhere. Um, and, you know, they're CPAs and they're college professors and they're whatever, you know, but they have a desperate desire to be something, to be someone, you know. I mean, contributing in the way that they're contributing isn't enough for them. They want, you know, they want the, uh, the fame of being, oh, I'm a 007, you know, and they are so eager and anxious to be superior to someone you know, that they can take that with them to the grave because otherwise they feel like their life isn't worth anything. And that's very sad. I mean, you go to crooks and they basically are torturing and killing you for money, period. But these other fools tell them that they're, tell themselves that there's something special. And yet when you turn and stare at them, they run away. How very special. And that's the mystique, and that's the mystique of the intelligence agencies, you know, running around, making out like they're, oh, that the intelligence agencies are so special, that secrecy is also special, the 007 is also special, you know, that's the mythology that we are living with in this society, in our current society today, and that these people fall for, because they are being roped into what the CIA is doing, they're roped into what the DHS is doing, they're roped into what the FBI is doing, and we, as as a society are supposed to look up to these agencies, the DHS, the CIA, the FBI, as super, you know, supernatural, God, demigods among us. They are investigators. They are so intelligent. They are focused well, on security. Right. Total and BS. Yes. And they're, and they're telling themselves, oh, these people have chosen us because we're so very special. And then you get back to NSA headquarters or somewhere else and they've chosen them because they're oh so very stupid. Oh, so very naive. Malleable, pliable, docile, all of that. And what the, what the, what the Bolsheviks called useful idiots. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the points we've made are, are just so amazing as we were as, as you were talking, I was casting my mind back and um, I genuinely feel I have seen this movie before. 
And um, I really, in, in down into the last detail, because everything that you describe is exactly spot on, you know, the useful idiots. And the last time I've seen it, that was in the communist system. And exactly as you said, um, the absolute scum of society has been empowered and they are taking out good people. So it's, it's kind of like you take the scum, you put it on top, you put it into positions, and then you squeeze out the good people. But because these idiots can't actually perform, you degrade the entire system, you know? And that's how system inversion works. You kind of put in the bottom at the top, and then you just push the um, system down. And because there are only few positions, and it's so hard to dislodge people, you know, that's why these, these people stay, um, stay in there. Um, the, the, the part I was having to say, I think I'm getting micro feedback again. Um, yeah, a little hard to hear you. Um, so I, I, think, I think the key to realize to all this is, I mean, number one, what I really totally, um, you know, uh, sign up to is we have to start going after individuals, you know. That's what they do, <coughs> start ganging up on, on individuals, and we have to do the same thing. Um, we have to really, and I would propose going after the figureheads with a statutory duty to fight terrorism. So, y'all, my my tablet is getting hacked right in front of my face. It is changing the configuration. Oh my god! Right, I mean, I, I just took a, a screenshot of it. Yeah, I suspected it's something like that because the um the micro uh, the camera went, and then I could hear you act really. I could hear the rustle that you were trying to do something really quickly. I mean, this is ridiculous. And, um, you know, we have to go after this criminal. And we have to go after the criminals who are protecting this criminal. And well, we have to go after the key word. I think, that's what you, I think that's what you're doing right now. I think you're, it's a parasite class. Yep. That's, the, that's the upper class. It's a par they contribute nothing. They cause mayhem. And one aspect of uh, psychopathology that's not talked about is they can't do any wrong. In their eyes, they'll never take responsibility. You know, they're trying to pull off. Hi, uh, my friend. It's a poor Hi, side class. Uh, that's the, that, the upper class. It's a they contribute nothing. They cause mayhem. And one aspect of uh, psychopathology that's not talked about is they can't do any wrong. In their eyes, they'll never take responsibility. We've got friends that come out. Hi, I think you have your computer on. They contribute nothing. They cause they can't do any wrong. I don't. You need to mute one of the one of the things. Okay, one. Well, yeah, hello. Uh, I am not connected with my PC, it's with my mobile. But then you have to mute the other, the other channel because we are hearing ourselves with a several um, minute delay. You have to switch off the um, television. What you, what you could do, Frederick, until you're set up, is you have to mute your mobile phone. Um, you have to mute the phone, device okay. with which you're um, connecting. So there's a little microphone symbol at the top, and you just have to press that. Okay, where is it? It's, um, it's on the screen. If you go to the very top, I think if you touch the screen, there should be a little microphone icon. And if you just press it, it just mutes it, and then you can set it up. And then it's not um, disturbing the chat. Otherwise, we are hearing ourselves. Be, um, five, five. I, would like, I would like to reconnect with Chrome browser um, because I am on my mobile and uh, we have tried before with the, um, the, the desktop. It was working better. Okay, let's do that. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I think Frederick is connecting for the first time, so it's always, I think he was trying to use two, uh, you know, his mobile. We'll work on church. Yeah, we did a quick test, and I, I think it works on his computer. So I, I tried to set him up before he comes online and actually try that. But a microphone and a video works, works really well. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, I forgot who was speaking last time. I it wasn't you, Paul. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, disconnect me and reconnect me with the PC. I'll do it another time. This is more important. Frederick is more important because I want to get the information on his case out because he's, uh, 
He's being forced medical injections now. So that's against one of the things that we were talking about. Neil Smelter should be getting right on that case. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. And I think this is what I, you know, we were talking about um, the point of these, um, all of these things. And, and so uh, my, my view is that what we're describing is, is deep capture by organized crime. And they are like psychopaths, they are you know, mostly psychopaths, but they also imprint their culture and, and pathological lying is one of the features. And that's why they are taking the victims and they are terming them terrorists, where, whereby actually they are the terrorists themselves. And everything is inverted, you know. Um, but this is how the case of Frederick um, actually ties in with the things that we were saying, because in his case, you can see the criminal, the criminal class, the criminal conspiracy between different people, between the um, police officers involved, in my view, between psychiatry and also between, I think, um, the Prefet de Lisere, who was ultimately responsible for this. And um, I would say there's always the, the question of, are you dealing with honest people who just don't understand or don't know what's going on? Or are you dealing with people who are actually conspiring in a criminal fashion? And for me, as an investigator, the telltale sign is that when it's genuinely innocent people who just don't know, when something really unusual happens, a question mark has to appear on their face and they have to be at least surprised or they have to request further information, they have to feel uncomfortable. When it's a criminal conspiracy, they know it's a criminal conspiracy, and then they just, you know, they are just acting elbows and charging headlong like a bunch of wild boars, totally convinced of themselves. And if they were innocent, along the way, there would be so many warning signs, so many inconsistencies and irregularities that an innocent person would slow down and think, hang on, what's going on when this is not happening and these people are you know going like that it means they are executing a plan that's already agreed there are no further questions in the minds of these people and when i was listening to frederick's case that's what really got me and i leave it out uh, you know up to the um to the audience to listen to his st story carefully and actually try to spot all those instances whereby the way the people behaved is in total contradiction to them being just innocent, you know? And always ask yourself, is this how a person who's never heard about microwave weapons would act? Is this how a genuine police officer, a genuine psychiatrist would act? You know, and, and literally try to see at what stage can you tell? Is, are these people genuine and just uninformed? Are they actually part of a criminal conspiracy? Because in one, um, scenario, they should get really unsure, have questions, not understand things. And the other one, they're totally self-confident, you know, and they are relying on their team to back them up. Um, and it's, it's incredible. But I think um, it's very important to listen to Frederick's case and also to, because it ties in with something that Millicent experienced as well, because she was um, also um, you know, she had was slandered, I would say, by doctors who were questioning her mental health, even though she has scans showing the implants in her bodies, even though she already had implants removed and, and, and. Um, and that, to me, is always an indication that there's some sort of criminal element in the medical profession. You know, she also had a case where actually, um, you know, um, an Ill illness that was diagnosed was brushed aside for vacuous questions about mental health. Now, a normal doctor wouldn't, you know, um, prefer speculation um, when, when there's actually medical tests saying, okay, this person really needs treatment, you know, and that's the telltale sign. But looking um, like more globally, I would say that we are now in the situation where we, we have our pyramid organizations in deep capture by organized crime. And the question is, how can we get them out? Because I would say, once an organization is captured at the top, it, it cannot repair itself that easily. You know, it cannot repair itself by itself because it would require, for example, the, the CEO to sack himself, you know, when the CEO is corrupt. When you're talking about the country, it would require the parliament to disband itself as being just, we're just too corrupt. We, someone else has to come in. You know, Joe Bloggs has to come in, has to come in off the street because he's more honest than us. That's not going to happen. So the question is, what sort of mechanisms are there to recover a system in deep capture? And there are only two, I would say. Number one is actually 
external force from a system even bigger than the original system. So that's why I think we have to work with the UN and find the honest people in the UN because in a sense, in a sense they've got less power than national people, but in a sense they're also bigger than any one nation state. So they have to help us recapture these systems. And then the second mechanism to recapture a system is, is through internal mutiny. So people have to rise up against the corrupt ones and actually just pull them down. So claw them and actually get them out of the position and throw them into jail. So I think going forward, what we need to do is we need to dig out all the legislation, legislation and administrative mechanisms to remove um, corrupt people from office. Because it's not the first time in history. So you, you guys were absolutely right. It's the head, of, um, the head of intelligence who are corrupt, the heads of the military, that's true. I think they're all criminals. I think there's evidence to say they're all criminals. We should name them criminals. But when a head of a military or head of an intelligence acts criminally against the interests of, it, of his own country, he is committing high treason. So these people have to re be removed, I would say, under high treason charges. And also under charges of premeditated, uh, premeditated murder um, and also you know, under charges of crimes against humanity. And, and Catherine, I think that idea of um, finding the administrative and legislative me mechanisms to remove people is brilliant. And that, that um, would you mention the issue of internal mutiny? So if we have all of these systems and organizations and agencies in place, and if we actually have good people inside of them, a fraction of good people, well, those good people need to wake up. You know, they need to get informed, they need to become aware, and they need to wake up and they need to become active. But you see, what we are dealing with currently is sort of large scale pusillanimity, people who are incredibly timid, people who will not go against the grain, who will not go against the flow. And people who also are so rolled inside this wall of secrecy thing that they've bought into it, you know? And I think actually Karen can speak to this. She's worked inside the NSA. And if I recall from all of her, my interviews with her, she and various other people in the NSA had no idea about the incredible criminality that, you know, she began to become acquainted with after she left the NSA. So she knows there are good people inside. So then the question becomes, how do we reach those good people? Why aren't they listening to us? You know, we want those good people to listen to us, to hear us. Can't hear you, Karen. Oh, thank you. Uh, part, of the, part of the problem with NSA is that you sign uh, agreements saying that you will not develop secrets and they are using, uh, you know, top secret classifications to hide crimes. You know, they're also using um, compartmentalization to hide crimes. I mean, you may have five branches in, let's say, research and development, two of which are actually operating criminal activity, but you don't know because you're not read on to the um, paperwork for that particular um, project. You know, the other three may be absolutely legitimate, and then these two are absolutely uh, treasonous and criminal. And if you say a word, you can be prosecuted. So I had told uh, several people when they asked, they said, well, why aren't, you know, why aren't people in NSA doing something about this? Or why are we not hearing more about more whistleblowers? And I said, because they can be prosecuted. And you're not even supposed to say people's names who work to, at NSA. You know, like if I know Bill Smith is in charge of this whole uh, operation to hurt people, I can't say Bill Smith's name publicly or I'll be thrown in prison. And they don't even want you to say Bill. You know, Bill's in charge of this. So that's just how ludicrous it is. Um, but I did read recently that with all of the uh, hoopla about NSA spying on people illegally, and, and they're taking it literally as spying, they don't even know about the torture, that a lot of people are actually laterally transferring out of NSA. I mean, you know, they just want out. They don't want to be a part of it, which is, it speaks to their honor, but it also speaks to what I talked about before, in, in that if you get rid of all of the good people in an organization, you'll never change it. You'll never be able to change it from within. 
you know, if everybody says, oh, I don't like the way you're doing, I'm quitting, I'm leaving, then you have corrupt police, then you have corrupt NSA, you know, then you have a corrupt legislature. And it's, it's daunting to stay, you know, uh, and I think they're afraid that their lives will be ruined, so you can't blame them for leaving, but it, it's very much a barrier to changing things from within. Right, I think the people that are perps and the people that work for these psychopaths that are at the top. Now, you know that Guantanamo was supervised personally by George W. Bush through uh, Rumsfeld. So we're talking about a couple psychopaths there at the top. And the people that work for them, including the person that is working with you, Millicent, should know that they're the suckers on the bottom of their list. Uh, I think it was Kissinger that said, the people that don't use their brains are no better than cattle. So the people that they can manipulate and the people that they can lead around and the people, whether they're misinformed or whether they're uh, duped into this uh, psychopathic wet dream that they're acting out here, is uh, they're on the low level. They, they, the psychopaths regard them as nothing but slaves and cattle. You know who they revere? You guys. That's why they're going after you. Because you use your brain and you're open and you can present a legitimate threat. So on their hierarchy of people they regard, you're right next to the psychopaths. I mean, you are the ones that they're, they're even frightened of. But the people that are follow, following these out and these policemen and these uh, probably Neil Smeltzer, let's give him a chance to prove himself. But they think that they're cattle. They, they think that they're worthless because they'll do what they're told. And everybody, including your guy, Nelson, should know. That's how they're regarded by the parasitic class, the psychopath class on the top. They're not the revered ones. They're not the ones that are going to be taken on into the paradise with them. No. As soon as they're done wiping out of the valuable people, the people that can use their brains, they're going to be gone. What do they want them for? So, um, useful idiots. Right. Yeah. I think also, I think what a lot of people don't realize is, um, and this is something uh, that becomes clear when you are studying systems, is, and I, today more so, so anything that we saw in history today will be amplified because of the information flow. So when you want to pull off something really nasty, like for example, this big extermination program, um, in the olden days, you could kind of um, spirit people away and then you know you take them to Argentina, the old Nazis, or to the US, and then everybody forgets about it, and then yada, 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 it's all fine. But what these idiots don't realize is that in an information society, we now figure out who it is. So for the very top that we don't actually see because they're staying behind the scenes, um, at some point, when these people are done, they need to be disposed of because they're liability. If they're ever dragged into court, they will talk. And that's why I think over the last years, we saw a rise in the number of people who just like, you know, um, pop their clogs. Because if they ever got into a court and got a bit ratty against their old colleagues, they could do some serious damage. Um, and I think this is why we saw, you know, a... Uh, um, Many cases where people maybe got arrested and died in jail or, you know, there were, I mean, many people died, you know. Um, so if you look at high profile fraud cases and, and also war criminal trials and all this sort of stuff, you know, um, they, they, they died sometimes in jail, amazingly. Because, you know, you would think a jail is one of the safest places where it can be because they can keep you totally surveyed. But funnily enough, people hang themselves, you know, so often, you know, and then there's no way for the jailers to ever notice that in time, you know, even though hanging yourself takes, it does take a couple of minutes, you know. Um, yeah. Well, there is somebody, no. there is somebody that we know, Ramon and I know, uh, Catherine, you may or may not, but she's been a, a um, targeted person for a very long time. She's connected to big money and that's why they targeted her to take everything she had. And it, her, it's her opinion that the perps actually do have peasant policies taken out on them as well. And once they have reached their usefulness, they are eradicated in car accidents and other types of things. And if they happen to have children, those children go into a pedophile ring. So they are dooming their children 
where they think that they're murdering people for uh, a college education for their dear, dear little ones. But no, they may get actually annihilated themselves and their children may be sold into slavery. So that's something for them to think about, I think. Right, exactly. It doesn't, the secrecy stuff doesn't work in a pyramid organization in the information age. Because the pyramid works top down. You tell the guys what to do. But when you're in the information age where you generate information, it's a uh, anathema. I don't know why. It, it doesn't fit with the organization. So they built cocoons around it in organizations called project managers. And they cocoon these off. In general society, it's still not going to work because the up openness is going to militate against the secret societies. And it's just a matter of time. And that's why they have to wipe out the best and the brightest and take them out. Because the, as we move more into the information and as more stuff gets out, their game is kind of over. Uh, let's introduce Frederick LaRoche. We've talked about your case before, Frederick, and we're real interested in hearing it from your own lips and what's going on with you right now. Welcome to the uh, Techno yeah. Crime Fighters Forum. Okay. Hello. Yeah. So I, I'm a TI from France, and yeah. my case is a 19 years old uh, case. Uh, so during uh, maybe uh, 15 years, I was not able to understand what, uh, what was happening to me because I did not rely on the internet to find the information. So I was trying to find out by myself. And uh, uh, I was having uh, encounters with the, the people around me. Uh, they were harassing me. Uh, and uh, I was having encounters and talking with them. So I was knowing that they were for real. And I have uh, understood that, that they were following me. And uh, it's only later uh, uh, that uh, I, I have been to the covert uh, harassment conference in Berlin in 2015. And that's when I have uh, discovered the, the theoretical uh, things b behind everything. So it's only at that moment that I, I understood everything that was happening to me and that I was not the only one. So besides the harassment and uh, the gang stalking, I was also um, assaulted with uh, directed energy weapons. Um, and um, at the beginning, I was not able to understand how they were doing this. Uh, I was thinking of um, uh, uh, some kind of sound, sound uh, wave uh, weapon. And after that, I, uh, I came up to a, a hill and uh, there was no in inhabitation in this hill and they were capable of attacking me. I realized that it was not coming from the wall next to me. It was coming from something upper and maybe uh, planes or satellites. And then I understood that uh, to travel the, the void space, it would be only electromagnetic uh, weapons. So that's how uh, I made my understanding by myself because I am uh, uh, scientifically uh, tuned in my mind. Um, and then after understanding everything in the conference, I, I came back uh, in France and uh, I decided to uh, do something to inform the people about this uh, happening to me, of course. And I was using my case to uh, make the people uh, understand what was uh, happening everywhere. Um, so uh, I started the website and uh, I started to tell my story and uh, there were two friends from uh, Paris in a, a cinema school and they came to me and they made uh, a small video about myself. So um, I have shown this video uh, on, on the conference in Berlin and then I have put it online uh, later. Uh, and from that I was talking about my, my situation, my testimony uh, on my, my website. And uh, I decided uh, when there were uh, some uh, street protests in France called La Nuit Debout. And uh, it was a, a kind of street protest uh, against uh, the, some, some kind of uh, change in, in the French laws, uh, the, the social laws that we were having uh, for protecting the, uh, uh, the, the, empl the employers uh, uh, from being uh, fired at, uh, with, without any uh, compensation, etc. So we have very good laws to protect the, the workers in France. And 
they were a, a, a sort of uh, da damage co caused to, to the laws we have in France. And the people were uh, um, not, not uh, happy with this, so they were going in the street to protest. And I, I joined them. And in the streets, uh, I was also uh, distribut distributing some flyers and uh, having a big board uh, sign and standing everywhere to uh, alert the people about the gang stalking, about the electronic harassment that has, it was happening to me, of course, but I was trying to uh, make the people aware that it was maybe uh, one day happening to them also. So um, at one point I decided to go a step further. So I have placed giant stickers uh, on my car with uh, uh, some kind of slogan, anti-gang stalking and with my website display. So it was all, of, all over my car. And uh, I was driving everywhere with the, the car uh, with that. And uh, some people were noticing my car and I could see on the logs of my website that people were coming to visit me from everywhere I was going with my car. And uh, um, so from that point, uh, I have tried to join the street protest with my car. And uh, I noticed that the organizers were agreed that I could join, but only at the back of the, the, the protest. And it was fine, but after some time, I saw the police trying to uh, remove my car from uh, the, the protest. And uh, I tried to come again, and they have finally came to me to tell me, well, well sir, we are not sure you are allowed to be there because you are not on the uh, uh, organization list. So please uh, be aside of uh, the protest. And from that moment, I understood that the police was not very happy with my uh, activism. and. Um, after that, I, get, uh, I got fired from my company because of the, the stickers on my car, because they were thinking I was a kind of crazy person. And actually, uh, it was just a kind of pretext because uh, the, the, I think the real reason was that um, my company was feeling that someone uh, from, their, from their company was a victim of uh, this kind of uh, harassment. And maybe they were aware that if someone is a victim of this kind of harassment, uh, it has something to do with a, a system, a global system network, with uh, including the, the, the corporates, etc. So they, they they try to remove me. Finally, they did, and um, then uh, in the beginning of 2017, uh, there were a, a preparation for uh, the uh, presidential election day. So I was thinking I should do something before the election to uh, uh, explain uh, the, the French politicians uh, about, about this situation. And I have prepared a long email during many months. Every weekend I was writing a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And I decided to uh, build my, my email around the case of Catherine Orton only. And uh, I have translated in French three of her video that I have uploaded on my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, I have written a, a big, big uh, email about her case. And I was trying to explain that this case was real and was understandable. And uh, I have translated three of the video. And it, it, at the end, I have aided my case. So I was not trying to put myself forward. I was trying to link different things. and. Uh, uh, I have sent the emails to all the French deputies and the French senators and also the, the European uh, deputies, the 800 person, plus 400 person, plus 400 person. And then I have sent the email to all the trade union syndicalists of France. It was uh, a few hundred persons more. And uh, I have also reached reach out this email to the, the media, the main media, also the independent media, and uh, all the person I was knowing uh, about La Nuit de Boue in France and in Grenoble and in Paris. So actually, I think I have sent maybe, uh, maybe almost uh, 3,000 emails. And uh, it was including some, some files. Just briefly, um, uh, the question, because I think this is really important. When did you send these 3,000 emails? Because it sounds like you informed absolutely everybody in France. Yeah, it was at the end of April. So it was after the first day of election for the presidential election and before the second term. So it was in the middle. And then something very strange has happened to me, uh, maybe eight days after sending all these emails. So it was on the 2nd of May, uh, the day before, 1st May, 
uh, I was doing a, a, another street protest and uh, I have forgotten my USB key I have used in a shop and uh, it was for printing the flyers. So I called the shop on the Monday first. Uh, I will come tomorrow uh, at uh, a, a quarter to 12 p.m. I have to get back, get back my USB key. And they say, yes, that's okay. So I came with my car in the city center and just in the street, uh, reaching the shop exactly at the time of the appointment. Uh, there, was two, there was two cars in front of me and the first car was trying to park and the car behind was uh, stopped and I was also stopped behind uh, these two cars. So the first car has, have found, has found a place to, to park and the car be behind me was not moving and I was expecting this car will go and no, it was not going. So my car has just moved a few centimeters because I was thinking this car will go and she did not. So I just came to the limit of contact of the car and I stopped and there was no damage, there was no contact, no accident, there was nothing but the two person inside the car, they were uh, looking at each other for five seconds, they were transmitting some kind of message and then they have decided one, the driver, he was getting out the car and he was coming directly to my window and he was making a big scandal in front of everyone uh, in the streets and uh, he was telling me, what are you doing? You have hit my car, what, what is this? You are driving crazy, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was not able to understand because there was nothing, nothing has happened. And then a few seconds later, the lady, uh, the, the, the passenger of the, of the car, she also get out of the car and she came in front of, of her car and then jo joining the man uh, in front of my window. And she was also making the big scandal. What? What is this? You have done this to our car. And actually, it was not possible to see because my car was very in, almost in contact with the, the, their car. So I have moved back my car and I have shown them there is nothing, sir. So why are you making such a big scandal about nothing? Please let me go. And they were still protesting. So I decided to move away and I have tried to move away on, on the left of their car. And then they have, they have moved the bodies in front of my car and they were trying to block me physically from moving the place. So obviously it was important for them that I was not allowed to move from this place and that I should be uh, seen uh, from the pedestrian as someone who has made an accident and they wanted me to get out of the car. And they were not interested to see the damage on their car. They were not talking to me about showing my insurance or making uh, um, a document stating about the accident. They were not interested about that. They were interested in, in blocking me here and making me get out of the car. So when I saw these two person in front of the car blocking me, I understood it was a kind of trap. And I was, used, I was used to that because they were doing me, this uh, surrounding me uh, all the time during uh, 19 years. So I was getting used of, of that. And I could recognize it was uh, some of this person, it was them. So I decided to go on. So I was driving, not fast, I was driving normally to just to get out of here. And then the man, he saw that I was moving forward. So he stepped on the left of my car and it was a little banging of my window and the lady no the lady she has not moved on the side she has stepped back and then she she has jumped on my car and she was she was hanging like this she was hanging like this standing uh, on the sides of my uh, front window and she was uh, standing standing like this and she was keep keeping her body on on the front of my car and uh, her foot was not touching the ground so I was thinking, my God, this is crazy, what she's doing? And I was thinking, okay, let's, let's go on. So I was continuing moving my car forward and she was not uh, lifting the car. So at one moment, I had to turn the wheel because I was uh, going away from here and, and the, the road was turning. So I had moved my wheel and then she has uh, left lift one of her hand was uh, removed of, of the car and she has rolled and slipped and fell, fell on the ground. So uh, at that moment, I, I felt that uh, I had no point to stay more here because there, were, there was no accident. I have not tried to escape from an accident and I have not 
hit purposely this lady. It was her aggressing me and me uh, trying to manage with a, a very strange case, very strange situation, unusual. So I have done my best and uh, I have gone back to my home. And then on the next day, I received a few phone calls from the, the police and uh, they were asking me, please, sir, uh, it seems that something has happened regarding your car in the city center yesterday. Could you please uh, tell us more and come to the, the, the police station? So I was not able to, to pick up the calls. I have just received the voice message. And then I decided, well, it's okay. And uh, the last message was asking me to come uh, in the morning. So I, I was ready to come in the morning. And then in the morning, they were at my door. And then they were looking at my at my car. Just one question. One of yeah. the things that I'm interested in is how did they have your phone number? Yeah, Were they calling well, your mobile or your landline? Yeah, I have asked them, why didn't you call to my landline? Because uh, my landline is always active and my mobile is always switched off. And they said, well, we didn't find your landline because it is not in the yellow page. And I said, yes, it's, it's, it's right, because I have not authorized my number to be in the yellow page. But for my mobile number, it is not neither in the yellow page. So I have no idea how they got my mobile number. And uh, then they came with the military police. And the military police, I think they were two, two persons. And uh, when they saw that I was not uh, resistant uh, to their uh, visiting me, and I was accept, accepting their visit to me, and uh, they decided to leave the place. And they told the police, well, uh, obviously, we see that you don't need our help. So we'll, we're leaving. And then there were four uh, police officers left. Four, uh, no, three, three, because um, two of them have taken me in their car, and the third one has taken my car, and we have gone to the police station. And just before that, the officer was asking me, please, can you show at us the front of your car? And I showed them the front of my car, and they saw that there were no damage, no blood, nothing no no scars nothing so they were surprised and i was surprised that they were surprised and then more surprise were to come so we went to the police station and on the way uh we were i was already trying to explain the situation as i have understood it uh from from the the, day, the two days before when it was happening uh i told them um, well, I think it's a fake car accident, and from my point of view, it is uh, connected with my being harassed from many years. So I have tried to explain them what it is about, and they were thinking, well, this, this is a kind of lunatic person. Um, it, this is not so interesting, it's not, not so important and not so dangerous. And then we came to the police station. and. Um, um, then the, uh, I have asked for uh, ask, uh, the, ask the help of a lawyer and, uh, and the visit of for uh, with a doctor, and the doctor came first and uh, he was asking me. Uh, so do you really say that uh, it was a fake um, car accident and it was maybe the uh, the, the secret services uh, who harass you since many years? Do you really uh, think this? Yes, I really think it is, this is very really possible, sir. And do you know that uh, when people say such things, uh, they are never believed and you are aware that you are not going to be believed? I say, yes, I know this is difficult to believe, but I will try to explain you little by little. And I say, you know, that's, that's enough. Uh, I will just make my first uh, medical report. And that was done. It, the medical report was obviously that uh, I was delusional or something. I didn't see exactly what he wrote, but it was probably this. And then I saw the lawyer and the lawyer said, uh, well, why didn't you stop to check that the lady was not harmed? And I said, well, uh, I didn't think about this because I was a little scared and I was uh, wanting to escape from this. I was afraid that the man was coming uh, back to me and uh, he was maybe trying to hit me if I get out of the car. So uh, maybe uh, that, that was the only thing the lawyer told me. So I don't know if it was helping. And when we make the encounter, we make the encounter with the, the, the police officer, the lawyer, and me. So the lawyer was not telling anything. Uh, the, the police officer told me that there was a complaint, that there was a, an accident, and a, a severe injuries to uh, a person I have hit with my car. And a witness 
that I have tried to escape from the accident spot, which is totally illegal things. Um, later on, I discovered that there were there were no complaints, no injury, uh, no one has been sent to the medical emergencies or um, uh, taken by the firemen or anything by the ambulance. Uh, the car that was in front of me and pretended that there was an accident has gone, disappeared and vanished, and the police has no clue where it has gone and who were the two persons inside the car. Later on, I received also a, a message from my car insurance that there was an accident um, um, declared to this uh, company, but they were not allowed to give me the details because it was uh, something to deal between the, the headquarters of the two uh, insurance company. And uh, um, until now, they, they don't have the, the, the details of what has happened. So they don't know if someone has got injured. They don't know if there was a real accident. The only thing they told me uh, recently in a letter uh, I just received, it's that we are going to cancel your uh, insurance contract because we are feeling you are responsible of an accident, even if we don't know uh, nothing about this accident. And uh, since there is an, uh, um, um, an inquiry uh, 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 going on, done by the police on you, on you uh, regarding this, uh, we are going to terminate your contract because it's written uh, in our contract. If you are responsible, then you cannot uh, continue with us. Um, so the police has got my car and they have not given it back to me. So I had to inquire about this also. And it's uh, um, the, the police who gave the, the car to the uh, prosecutor of uh, my, my place, the Grenoble. So the prosecutor is keeping my car uh, under um, the, the fact that there is a, uh, an inquiry uh, still going on on me and on my case. but. Um, Actually, they told me that I will get my car back when the inquiry will be closed. And either it will be closed because the case will be dismissed, or it will be closed because the judge will ask me to answer some question about some criminal case or some criminal points they will come uh, about uh, if, if they really uh, can do that. I bet I don't know about that. Um, and then uh, the police. Uh, and, the, and the police officer in the police station has shown me a paper from the distance. You see, this is a medical certificate and it's showing that you have injured severely a person. And so we consider that you have made a criminal offense of a murder attempt. And he has not shown me the, the paper. I could not see what was written on that, even, even the name of the doctor or the medical uh, circumstances and the details, nothing. And, there was absolutely nothing. It was just totally fake. It's a, it's a trick that the police use to make the people confess about uh, crimes because they don't have enough clues and they just expect me uh, to tell more things that uh, they can inquire by, by themselves. And uh, that's the only thing they have. It's my testimony I have made under the, the threat that there was a complaint and there was an injury, that there was a a victim and there was an accident so everything was fake and uh, after I have explained my uh, point of view that it was something um, um, an entrapment from the secret services so they were not believing me and they have called the mayor of the city to tell him we have someone pretending something crazy what should we do and the mayor said well, you should check this guy with the uh, psychiatric emergency of the city, and then you, she will decide, the doctor will decide if he can be jailed or sent to the mental hospital. And I have been sent to the uh, psychiatric emergency, and then I saw a doctor. During half an hour, I talked with her. I have explained all my life, uh, 19 years uh, with a short uh, explanation. And she was thinking, oh my God, Maybe this guy has suffered of something, I don't know what, maybe it is in his head, but maybe he's dangerous because maybe he wants to get some revenge, maybe that's why he has hit this lady, or maybe he can make, commit suicide. And because of these two suspicions that I am dangerous for myself and for others, she decided that, no, he cannot go to jail, but to mental hospital, yes. And then I have been sent to the mental hospital 
the, the next day, actually 24 hours after uh, uh, being uh, taken to the police station. So I have spent one night in the police station. Um, and actually, can I, can I interject because there are some wonderful nuggets in this already, right? And that's exactly what I mean. I asked the audience before you came on to think about, is this how normal people would ha act? Like normal police officers and normal, you know, psych psychiatrists and normal mayors. And I would say, let's start with the police officer. So apparently there's this huge massive accident and they are called out and literally four police officers plus two military police to arrest you, right? I mean, because they're that dangerous, really. Um, and then they come out and there's supposedly to be this horrific accident and your car doesn't even show a dent. Well, you know, all those of us who had the misfortune of falling onto a car because we fell off a bicycle, you realize that these days the cars are built such to absorb kinetic energy and they dent like nothing else. So I doubt that you can actually fall on, you know, any car in an accident and not leave a dent. You know, I, it has to be something very, very special. So there's no dent. So what the hell? So there's no police officer thinking, hang on. You know, the other thing you mentioned that you think uh, led to your, uh, uh, you know, sectioning is that you mentioned electromagnetic weapons or microwave weapons. And I think if a police officer hears microwave weapons and is normal as opposed to corrupt, he should think, hang on, you can cook meat with a microwave. If some idiot takes that emitter out and uses it as a weapon, he can probably cook meat with it, right? So that sounds kind of dangerous. Maybe I want to find out more about these sort of weapons this guy keeps talking about. Because to me, being harassed with them for, you know, 19 years sounds like organized crime. Maybe I want to know a bit more about organized crime in my region. But no further questions. You know, none. And then you get to the psychiatrist and you, you tell these stories and you sound totally sane. And you just say that all of these things happened. And then, and then what? The psychiatrist thinks after 19 years this person spontaneously, literally that week, wants to kill himself or kill somebody else. But really, like ni after 19 years, I mean, why didn't he do it the week before or the week before that for 19 flaming years? Like, what, what has changed, you know? Like, if you weren't dangerous for 19 years, like, why are you dangerous that week? It's nonsense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, after that, I have been sent to the mental hospital and I have seen one more uh, doctor and um, they gave me some pill um, in the morning and then they give me also some drops uh, to drink at the night and they are psychotropic uh, medicine and the next day I was uh, full of that those drugs in my blood and uh, this, this this drug I know the side effects so they are making paralyzation paralyzation of my muscles and uh, I cannot move my back I cannot move my shoulder my neck I cannot move the, the muscle of my face and my, my mouth and my tongue get paralyzed. And then I swallow my tongue and I cannot breathe. And during the, the whole day, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, I was like a zombie like that, walking everywhere slowly because I wanted to keep calm, uh, to, to, to make them understand that I am not someone um, afraid of anything, but I am suffering and they must not take note of that. And I was uh, not able to, to breathe. I was <laughs> <laughs> so it was really a, a creepy show. And uh, finally, in the and in the in the in the next day, the doctor said, "Yes, okay, we will remove all these drugs." And I said, "Yes, that's good. I want no drugs at all." And I said, "No, I cannot give you no drugs. You have to understand that I have to give you one drug." And I say, oh, okay, I understand. It's because there is some uh, connection with uh, some authorities and they don't want me to be without any drugs. No reply. So finally, they gave me something very light and uh, uh, there was no side effect. So I say, okay, why not using this drug if, if it is really necessary? And then after five days, I have been moved to the main psychiatric ward for two months. I have stayed there two months. And um, they have increased the dosage, of course. Uh, they didn't want to let me with a small dosage. And the, the side effects have come back. So I told them, please, don't do crazy things. Uh, you are poisoning me. 
and uh, they were telling me strange, strange thing. They were, but sir, we cannot uh, believe what you say when you say that you feel hurt or damaged or poisoned because your mental stage is not able to uh, see clearly through yourself. So you cannot understand yourself and see your own uh, functioning of your body because you are completely delusional. So if you are crazy, you are not able to talk about yourself and we, not, we cannot consider what you are telling us as possible. So we have to continue the investigation with uh, the drug treatment to, to understand by yourself. So finally, I was trying to harass them about my pains and finally they understood it was real because I have seen maybe two or three doctors to, to make them admit that. So finally, they dec decreased again the dosage. And uh, finally, the deal was, you will be allowed to get out of the mental hospital if you ac accept monthly injection. And one inj injection will contain 300 milligrams of a certain drug. And this drug will operate on you uh, during 28 days. And every 28 days, you have to visit us to make a new injection. And you have to visit also every two weeks a psychiatrist for half an hour to discuss, just to be sure that your um, obsession are not coming back again, and to be sure that you are not going to uh, be dangerous again. So, And uh, the psychiatrist in the, the, the hospital, she was insisting on the fact that it is no more the car accident that is the pretext of my, uh, me being kept here. It is my ideas. It is my ideas that are keeping me here. And the, after the, the first week uh, I was in the hospital, they have to make, it's mandatory, they have to make a, a report, medical report. And then it's going, this report is going to the, the police commissioner, we call this uh, le, le, le préfet, so it's going to Le Prefet. And uh, from the, the medical report after the first week in the hospital, the Prefet conf confirmed that I have to be kept in the mental hospital for uh, one month. And after this month uh, has finished, there was one more medical report. And the re report was stating that I was uh, making some efforts to, to join the point of view of the doctor. And the, the point of view of the doctor was that my point of view was delusional and I had to admit that uh, it was only some idea, foolish ideas I was having in my mind and it is probably explainable with something else. Uh, not like the way I think it. So uh, the report was a little better, but not so good because she was still uh, stating that I need uh, to be cured uh, still. So the Prefet de Lisère has confirmed three months more uh, in the hospital. So actually, I was supposed to get released in September. But the doctor um, made me uh, talk about my own website, my own videos on YouTube. And I was trying to tell her, yes, that is true. That's, it, it can be explained by something else. Yes, maybe I, I am in the wrong side. Maybe you are in the right side. So, And she even made me uh, see the videos from Catherine Orton. And she was uh, stating, well, I don't know how what, what, who is this lady? Uh, who is this? Uh, I don't know this Catherine Orton. And uh, look at her. She, she doesn't look uh, serious. And uh, she looks silly with this aluminum, aluminum behind her. So how can you believe such a woman? She, she, she's not to be believed. Uh, you should uh, move away from all these things. And uh, finally, I admitted all this. And finally, the doctor made the report that I can be released at the end of June. And then the, the Prefet de Lisère agreed. But still, there is a, a warrant on, on me. Uh, if I make anything uh, regarding my ideas, my ideas, and if I am doing anything uh, wrong, they can uh, still put me back in the hospital uh, until the month of September. And after September, maybe I will be completely free of the threat. You know, this is so outrageous. I think all of us just listening to the story are so absolutely appalled. It's yeah, I know, I know. But I think, you know, as we said earlier, so the first thing is just, just think, what? Then you get really shocked and then you get really angry. And then we get down to business and we're like, let's go after these bastards because I can smell around. 
We no, should. I'm, you know what, the first thing we did when I heard about this accident, I, you know, Frederick and I told, talked, and I said, how, where exactly did this accident happen? So I looked up this, air, uh, the place where the accident actually happened. And you have to imagine it's next to a massive church. It's like Place de la République, you know, and there are two really fast car lanes. And he turned out of one fast car lane, crossed the other and went into a side street. And there's a little parking bay in the side street, and that's where the cars were queuing. So he had crossed a really fast lane, was on standing on this, and then there was a stop and go situation, and he nearly bumped the car. You know, that was the original accident. Right. Um, and then what's really interesting is you, if you go on Google Street View and you see the little corner, there's a CCTV camera right oh, above. Wow. It's right on the street corner. So I said, you know, Frederick, why don't you just request a CCTV? Mm -hmm. Because all this, you know, fancy shenanigans should be on the CCTV. And not just that, every French town in the, you know, in France has a Place de la République. Every, like, it seems to me like every town. And that is usually around the massive church and around some massive site. So it's the, the prize square of every town. And if anything happens there, right, it's, it's kind of like really bad publicity for the authorities. So these Place de la Republiques are the most surveyed areas in every French town. So there's not just one CCTV. It's like it's CCTV wherever you go, even if you don't notice it, right? Because it's the Place de la Republique. If any idiot does something there, it's so bad for la Republique, right? So you've got this massive CCTV camera, and we are led to believe that the French police who apparently came across this terrible accident by this mad lunatic who needs to be locked up and they don't look at the CCTV? What? Like it's the first thing you demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a traffic Absolutely. camera as well. Absolutely. You know? It's a traffic camera. So you get the footage from the traffic camera. So where's the footage? And then they said, oh, you know, Frederick asked, uh, asked after four weeks and oh, you know, the footage got deleted. I'm like, I don't think so because no. it's the police's job to do the forensics. No, you can sue the police for that. You know, that's, the, that's what they're doing, right? Isn't that part of their, their jurisdiction, their job? Yeah. They're sort of monitoring the area with that yeah. camera? Exactly. And I think we should take these guys by their testicles and say, hey, yo, Mr. Anti-Terrorism, we're so cool. Where the F is the evidence now, if you're so Mr. Anti-Terrorism, so cool? Where the F is it? You know, where and is where the CCTV? And, and where the heck are those people, the so-called yeah. plaintiffs, who yeah. just... Yeah, where, where, they go? Go? where they disappeared to, you know? Yeah, where you know? Exactly. And then, you know, I think Frederick told me that one was an older woman, the other one looked kind of like darker skinned, who <laughs> could be a terrorist, and you're telling me you can't find them in France, even though right. they crossed a CCTV in France and have a number plate that's involved in an accident. Hmm... Very strange. And then what's absolutely hilarious, I have to comment on this because it you know, touches me personally. So Dr. Bigoshi, she is a psychiatrist. Now, I have taught physics at Oxford. I taught special relativity, particle physics, and nuclear physics, okay? Now, if I had to guess, Dr. Bigoshi was probably shit at physics and maths at school, which is why she decided to do the blah, blah science of psychiatry, I would guess. Right, so she knows jack shit about physics. I would like to explain to Dr. Bigoshi that this, what she can see, is what's also being used by most intelligence agencies if they want to shield, you know, radiation shield their chambers. You use metal. If you have a cinema and you don't want to use this, you use meshing, metal meshing, because it keeps signals out. And I've got a video where the back of my head is literally cooked and the guy who's making measurements in my room says he's never seen stuff like that before because his measuring device maxes out. So if I turn this on and show people what the radiation level is in here, I can just, maybe it even works now, if, it, if this resets. Um, just a live demonstration. I have got something like, um, 15, 15 microwatts per square meter or 20. If I open this up and I point it at the perps, it goes up to something like 100 or 200. And when the emitters are on, when they can see that I've taken this off, it goes up to about 900. So that's why I have this on Dr. Bigoshi, right? So Dr. Bigoshi, who knows jack shit about physics, about implants, about you know, intelligence agency entrapment operations knows is so sure 
that she knows really and knows it all and Frederick's version is wrong and without having done any research or having any idea about what microwave weapons are even are or, or current affairs or anything she certainly knows that he's wrong now is that a normal doctor because a normal doctor would be like what I mean you're just hailing in by these by the police officers who frankly know jack all about psychiatry so does the mayor so I'm landed with the case where the mayor diagnosed, you know, a mayor diagnosed the person after a car accident. And I'm thinking, you know, the other thing I kept thinking listening to Frederick is I lived in France. I lived on the French side when I was working at CERN because the rents are cheaper. So we were, you know, living in France and traveling around by car in France is deadly because the French do not drive their cars like the Germans or the British. It's like a death trap. You know, we saw deadly accidents with cars flipped on their roof on the other's lane, you know, ev almost every week it, fe it felt like. There were just deadly car accidents where several people died, you know, if not every week, then certainly every two weeks as we're just commuting into Tucson on a, you know, five or seven kilometer strip. And we decided that France is one of the deadliest places to drive because the French are nuts compared to the Germans. And then... A French police officer comes across like a pissy little accident scene and he's like, oh, major alert. There's like a mad person on the French roads. I'm like, hello, you're a police officer. You know, if you think that's mad, you know, you should go to Paris. You know, <laughs> you should section half of Paris because they're mental. So I'm like, what is this? You have a car accident in France? Well, yes, you have them every week. And then 24 hours later, you section somebody. And then you say, you know, the real problem is not even the car accident. It's your ideas about mm -hmm. government corruption mm -hmm. and microwave weapons. And it's like, hello. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, that's so brilliant, Catherine, because you've pointed out that what, what, what happened over here, there was not a single dent in his car in a country that has and sees continuous accidents of a dramatic scale, as you, as you outline. I, and I think the standard car in France is one with dents, you know. <laughs> And so that's the first outrage, you know, that his car has no dent and then he's taken into the police station and these people who jump on his car, who try hard to injure themselves uh, and are still unable to injure themselves, uh, they are not taken into the police station. They are not questioned because they appear to me to be the loons in the matter. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm report Hello, police. I'm reporting a car accident that almost happened. And because it almost happened, I jumped on the man's car to make him stay to wait for a policeman to come out to an accident that almost happened. Why don't you put those people in the psychiatric unit for Pete's sake? Those people need to be in the psychiatric unit. They need the psychiatrist to come out and take a look at their mental processes. Instead, you have the innocent driver being carted off to, to the police station, and then you have doctors and mayors being trotted out. I mean, yeah. And, and, and it's totally the happening, beginning to end. The and, mayor and the people disappear. You know, the mayor suffers from delusions thinking he's a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, and it starts diagnosing and giving prescriptions, apparently, as to how to pull in other doctors and other psychiatrists. And oh, the other most appalling thing is to demand that Frederick be committed to a psychiatric institution and then be dosed with some his horrific uh, psychotropics, uh, that blows my mind. It's like, what are the laws in France that, that could possibly permit that without somebody's consent to simply dose them with yeah, horrific drugs? Like, paralyze your breathing for a day. I mean, you take medication that makes you feel worse. What sort of doctors are they? They are, they are criminals. They are criminals. criminals. This woman needs to be struck they're off criminals. forever. And I think there are psychiatrists in this country who are perfectly aware. They are, I, I think they're called dissident psychiatrists or dissident psychologists, people who know what these drugs actually do and who actually protest the use of these drugs. So there are people, there are psychiatrists in this country listening to this possibly, let's hope, who are perfectly aware that what was done to Frederick is nothing less than criminal. It is. And you know what, when he was asking for a lower dose and they said, oh, we have to give you something. Well, yeah, well I mean, yeah. that's a big fat question mark, because if you want to determine what's actually wrong with somebody, you want to observe them first. 
and find out so what exactly you know is he like when it's not influenced from outside and then if you have to buy it because you i don't know you think the mayor's watching you well give him vitamin c give him a tic tac you know exactly. something was it the, was it the mayor that demanded that he be given something something it's really great hey listen this is a great conversation and uh I'm really thankful, Frederick, that you were able to join us, and hopefully you'll get with myself or uh, Ramola and do a full-blooded interview because this is this is just great stuff. This is incredible. There's so much to say about this, and in fact, I want to get everybody back together again and talk about it. You know, right. I'd, love, I'd love to do it on my own show, certainly, uh, Frederick, if you're uh, available. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Wonderful. That would be great. Um, so, but we have to end this one uh, and bring this uh, Techno Crime Fighters Forum number 16 to a close. Thank everybody for their contributions. Um, we're kind of running late, so I'm not going to ask for final comments unless somebody really wants something. And raise your hand and, and then we'll go. But thank you very much, Frederick. What a great story. Um, we're going to feast on this for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you can get uh, released and uh, they'll start treating you like a human being again. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of uh, episode 16, Techno Crime Fighters Forum, and we're signing off.